if you are a God-fearing person, one thing is for sure, uh, and that is uh, God's blessing rests on you. And I can say that because that is taught all through the Psalter. So if you go way back to when we, when we started our study of the Psalms, Psalm 1 uh, validates the premise that if you fear God and obey his commandments, he then will then by definition bless you. So let's go back and review uh, Psalm 1 verse 1, which says this. How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked or stand in the path of sinners or sit in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord and he meditates on it day and night. Then he tells you what that man will be like. It says he will be like a tree firmly planted by the streams of water, which yields its fruit in its season and its leaf does not wither and whatever he does, he prospers. So just in the opening three verses, uh, Psalm 1 tells you kind of what the Psalter is going to be about. It's going to be about telling you that if you uh, fear God, stay close to him, uh, read his word and obey his word, he promises that his blessing will rest upon you. So if you want to li live a really successful life, that's what you do. You do what? You fear God and you obey God. It's pretty much that simple. And he promises to bless you. Um, so if you can identify with that, you could probably look back at your life and uh, begin to point out the times where God has blessed you because you put him first above all things. Uh, and when you look at uh, the, the Psalms, like we looked at Psalm 111 last week, uh, and do I have any notes? Because I'm going to need notes. You're going to need notes, really. Do I have notes? Is anybody talking to me today? So I probably shouldn't start without notes because it's, it's hard enough to do it. This is interesting. Alan, are you talking to somebody? There we go. See, there's some angel somewhere in the building. I, you know, behind the stage, it looks like NASA headquarters. There's a giant room of monitors and everything. It's actually kind of cool. So uh, thank, thank the guys for listening to me um, and obeying the scriptures to fear God and obey the commandments. So they, they're listening to the scriptures. God's going to bless those guys behind the stage and some of the ladies running the sleds. So Psalm 111, I gave you an assignment, correct? Yeah, remember that? You don't sound enthusiastic. Yeah, yeah. Now, a lot of you have sent me, sent me your acrostics, uh, and some of you are saying it's like it's too private. It's between me and God. I totally understand that. Uh, and, and some of you are, you know, sending them to me, telling me this is so fun. One person had done several super type A individuals, not shocking. Uh, and so uh, thank you for sending those. We're going to eventually uh, weave those through our, our services when we get into the praise psalms in a few chapters. Uh, and just showcase some people, maybe do some videos and things, uh, just for fun, uh, just snippets of how God has blessed you. Uh, so that was an acrostic. So what is an acrostic? Uh, anybody that is in the DC environment should understand acronyms and acrostics, correct? Right. I mean, even SCUBA is, a, is an acronym. I mean, everything's an acronym. So, uh, so this, Psalm 111 was an acrostic. So I mean, it started with the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet, and it went through uh, every, every clause of every verse was, the, was a Hebrew le alphabetical letter describing something about God that's praiseworthy. So you're, if you did the assignment correct, you wrote an acrostic using American language, of course, uh, and you w constructed something that praised God for his character and his person. That's what you were doing, correct? Or you, you're going, oh, no, I did something else. Okay, yeah, uh, that was the assignment. So uh, why am I saying that? Well, because Psalm 110, they believe, was written by the same psalmist in post-exilic times. Uh, and it, since it's written similarly, it has the same amount of lines. It has similar words in Hebrew. Uh, and it is also an acrostic. So 111 is an acrostic. 112 is an acrostic. Uh, so what that means is you have two assignments. You don't sound excited. You, you, sh you get two assignments, okay? You ready? So, hey, thank you. Yeah, wow. I know it's the middle of the summer, you know? It's like, oh, man. Yeah, so get excited. So Psalm 112, uh, the acrostic should be, alphabetical letters again, how God has blessed your life. How, how, and so start with A, go to Z, and each one of those letters should, uh, should either be a word or a brief clause of how God has blessed your life. Again, you can bring your kids into this, children grandparents, mom, dad, whatever, if you're uh, a widow, widower, single, whatever, any, anybody can do this, uh, but you're focusing on how God has done what? Blessed you, blessed you. Now, if you're sitting here thinking, well, he hasn't done a thing in my life, you don't know him then. I mean, because he, he blesses you. Remember Psalm 1, if you fear him and you keep his commandments, he will bless your life. So uh, it, with that in mind, I want to say a couple things about Psalm 112, because it's a little bit different in another way than Psalm 11. So it is an acrostic. Uh, but it is what is called a wisdom psalm. 
It's not a praise psalm, even though it starts with hallelujah, a praise statement. Uh, it is not a, a praise psalm per se. It is a wisdom psalm. So what is a wisdom psalm? So Dr. Alan Ross, who taught me Hebrew uh, at Dallas Seminary, uh, wrote in his commentary on the psalms, and I actually have the class notes for this, you know, back in the day before it became a book. But here's what he says about a wisdom psalm. He says, there are portions of the Old Testament that give attention to the importance of one's living his life in accordance with the Torah, which would be Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. He says, it's a, it's a practical wisdom that produces a pious and a productive life. Wisdom literature in the Old Testament, as well as in the ancient Near East in general, recognizes an established order in the world, i.e. God's law, that rewards virtue and industry while bringing justice to evil and sloth. So there's meritocracy in God's kingdom. You obey, he blesses you. And if you, if you disobey, he does not bless. It's how it works. And for those who work in obedience to God and get blessed, you don't share your blessings with those who aren't doing the work. This is how God rolls. And so it's a wisdom psalm. Another facet about a wisdom psalm uh, is it is generally true. Because when you will look at a wisdom psalm and you'll think, okay, it's giving me wisdom how to lead a blessed life. But there are exceptions as you go through life and you see some of the verses don't really pertain to Christians all of the time because there's exceptions as we're going to see. But by and large, it is a wisdom psalm applicable to all Christians at all time on how to live a blessed, happy, prosperous life. So who wouldn't want that? So if you're depressed today, this is your day, correct? You're going to walk out here feeling awesome. And if you're a Christian, you should be on fire when you leave. So question that this is going to entertain is, what are the praiseworthy blessings of God-fearing folks? I, I think folks is a Hebrew word uh, of the southern derivation. Uh, so we want to look at this. So it starts out, before he gets into the ways God has specifically blessed him in his acrostic, in verse 1, like verse 1 of uh, chapter 111, he starts out with a familiar, praise the Lord, exclamation point. And then after that, after he says that, he says, how blessed is the man who fears the Lord uh, and who greatly delights in his commandments. So the first praise statement is praise the Lord, hallelujah. Uh, it is a command in Hebrew. And because it's a command in Hebrew, it's not optional. You can't look at that as a Christian and go, well, hey, I am totally not into that praise stuff. I'm just not going to do that with my life. Uh, no, it is a command from God to live a, a life of praise. And then he, in this particular one, he says, you're praising the Lord, that's capital L-O-R-D, or Yahweh, or the God of all time, God, the eternal one, the great I am. And so if you can't think of a thing to praise him for, wow, you know, it's just, you know, sit, I mean, I have sitting in one of my coffee tables, a book of astronomy, because I love astronomy, and it's just pictures of the cosmos. And sometimes I'll just sit on the couch and just flip through the photographs, marveling at the vast nature of the cosmos and just the greatness of God the colors, the vast distances between everything, how great he is. And then it always makes me think of, if he's this great, then why would I ever worry about my life? So praise God. And so, you know, there might be books laying around your house that can help kind of uh, get the pump going of praise. So he's going to tell you here, there's uh, two foundational things behind the praise of God. Number one, he says, how blessed is the man who does what? Fears the Lord. Fears. So a lot of people will say, I've, I've got to fear God. Uh-huh. Yeah. You, you, you've seen. Now, I, I don't know if you ever watched The Wizard of Oz as a kid. I did back in the 60s when, you know, it was like new. Uh, and I was, the part that always scared me a lot was Oz, you know, behind the curtain. Didn't that scare you? It's black and white. You got two channels. Remember those days? And I always, I was, I always knew what was coming because they showed it once a year. I always knew that was coming, but it always scared me. But it's like, uh, okay, it's like fear. But then you would see Oz and you're like, the little guy, you know. Uh, not so God. It's uh, you fear God. Why? Well, you think of a lot of reasons why you would fear God. Uh, why, why should you fear God? Well, he's holy, which means anything that is not holy has no place in his presence. So he's absolutely holy. Like Isaiah, when he sees him in Isaiah chapter 6, he's transported to God's presence. He sees the Lord high and holy and lifted up. He hears the angels chanting, holy, holy, holy to the Lord God Almighty. And then it says when he sees all this, the, the effect on his life is he sees his sin. And he's a prophet of God. So God is absolutely holy. When Moses winds up in the God's presence, when he goes to see the bush that is burning, but it's not consumed, and he goes over to the bush, and the Lord speaks out of the bush that's on fire but not being consumed, and God talks to him and tells him, uh, hey, those sandals you've got on, you need to take those off. They're elevating you too high in my holy presence. So even his, the thickness of his shoe 
was too high to be in God's presence. So he took off his sandals because God is holy. Amazing. So he says you should fear God, fear God. So do you fear God? So how would you know pragmatically if you fear God? I'll give you some ideas. You think about him often. You think about him often. Whatever you're doing. Fearing God should affect how you talk to your wife, how you treat your children, how you treat pets, how you work at work, what you do when no one's watching you, how you drive on the freeway. Take note. Especially when you pass me with those church bumper stickers that I know were... It's kind of embarrassing. I need your phone number, you know. You just passed your passer, you know. Um, so it's, it, you think about God often. I do. I mean, whatever I'm doing, I'm always thinking about God. So uh, number two, uh, what you know about him actually influences your life on a daily basis. So what I know about him, he's omnipotent, he's omniscient. Oh, I mean, all the things about God translates into it changes my behavior. Um, additionally, you don't just burst or waltz nonchalantly into his presence. You don't just, hey, what's happening, dude? He's not a dude. He's God. You're reverent. You're reverent. Um, Hebrews 4.16 says we can confidently, in the New, New International Version, approach the throne of grace. We can confidently. Why can I confidently throw, approach the throne of grace in prayer? Because I'm covered by the blood of Christ. So I can confidently walk into his presence, but it doesn't say I can do it in a cocky manner. No, it's humble. So he says, uh, blessed is the man uh, who fears the Lord. Number one, do you fear the Lord? Do you reverence his name because he's holy? Number two, he says, in addition to that, a person who's blessed uh, is a person who greatly delights in his commandments. So what does that mean? Well, that's pretty simple. Uh, every law, rule, regulation that's in the scriptures from Genesis to Revelation, you look at those and you don't argue with them. You don't try to rationalize them away. I mean, when I was in high school, I had a filthy mouth. Did you? And you... We, I don't anymore, don't worry, but, but back then I did because you would use a mouth like that in sports to intimidate people when you played sports. And it was like the badder your mouth was, then the more ominous you could be to your opponents. And I was a Christian, I was the only Christian on the team at the time. And I would, I would go back home after a game and I would think, what in the world am I doing? What am I doing? Because if I truly fear God, it should affect how I talk, correct? And I eventually uh, had to give God my, my mouth because I would go through the scriptures and say, well, it says no, there's no place where it says you can't cuss. Thou shalt not cuss. Have you found it? I would look and I think, well, I guess it's okay for me to do that. That, that was me at 18. And I knew it was wrong. What does the scripture say? Uh, you are blessed of God if you delight, delight in his, in his commandments. Well, I found those verses which talk about my mouth, and they deeply convicted me, radically changed how I talk. It took me a while to gain control. Got Spirit of God helped me. But that's the foundation of the, of the text. We haven't even got into verse, uh, well, the essence of it yet. But blessed is the person who fears God and obeys what God says. Now, what's the fruit of that person? So the psalmist is going to go down through the passage and say, I fear God, I obey his word, and the fruit is on my tree of life. He's made a tree of my life. So don't argue with an apple. I picked an apple. If you're into oranges, just park it. Today, it's about apples, okay? So we're going to click down through the fruit. There's seven fruits. God's number is seven, uh, not by accident. So if you fear God and you are blessed of him, what kind of fruit would be hanging on your tree? Number one, fruit number one, his, or you could put your name in there, make it personal, uh, uh, your, your children will have an impact. So who, whoever is in the room that has children, who would not want to raise a Moses, a Joshua, a Deborah, uh, an Esther, a Paul, a Peter, a Jeremiah, except a John Calvin, a Martin Luther, a Henrietta Mears. I mean, on and on go the names. Who would not want to raise a Dwight L. Moody, a great person of the faith? What godly family would not want to do that? I mean, that would, that would just make your day if you raised the child that did great things for God. What are godless people doing? They're not raising children for maximum spiritual impact. But what does he say here in verse 2? His descendants, the person who uh, fears God and obeys his commandments, his descendants, notice the promise, will be what? Mighty. Where? On earth. And then he says, the generation of the upright uh, will also be blessed. So this is parallelism, where the second line also amplifies the first line. So let's analyze this. If you look at your life and you fear God and you, and you obey his commandments, fruit number one hanging on your tree should be, if I'm a parent, if I have children, my children 
according to God's word, if I am a godly parent, this is all the reason why you should have a godly home, my children will by definition be those who will be mighty on the earth. What does that mean? The word mighty, gibor, uh, is a term, it's a military term. It speaks of a soldier. So you could translate it, they will be mighty warriors on earth. Do you think he's speaking about, well, because you're in D.C., you're in the Army, the Air Force, the Marines, the what? You're thinking, well, yeah, he's totally underlying the fact that I serve in the military. No, he's not saying that. He's not saying your child's going to go to West Point, Air Force Academy, anything like that. He's saying he's going to be mighty in a spiritual way. He's going to be a gibor, a mighty warrior. Um, David's bodyguards were called giborim. Giborim is plural uh, of gibor. So David's crack troops that surrounded him to protect him, his greatest soldiers were called giborim. But he's applying this in a spiritual way, saying, if you fear God and follow his commandments, you're going to, by definition, raise children that will be mighty warriors against darkness, against the evil. What does our culture need? It needs godly parents who raise their children to fear God, obey his commandments. And what happens by definition? God says, I will in turn bless your family and your culture with children who are mighty warriors against evil. What could be better? What could be better? What kind of children will those be? They'll be ones who will fearlessly swim against the carnal cultural stream. They will not be afraid to raise their hand in a a class at a university to tell a professor, uh, I respectfully take issue with that false premise or that wrong ideology. They'll be brave. They'll be brave. I had a young college student approach me last week because this time of year we have a lot of college students who have been here all summer. They're getting ready to go home. Young lady cornered me over here last week after, as we were leaving the last service. And she said, Pastor, I just I need a couple of titles of apologetic books to read before I go back to school uh, you know, in, the, in the fall. Could you give me some titles? What, sure. Here's some titles. I, I, can, I can tell you that's a young lady that's raised by parents who fear God follow his commandments, and their child is being raised to be a gibor, a warrior for Christ. There's hope for our country. Why? Because we have godly people doing that. What's God say? I'm going to bless those families. Uh, on Sunday evenings at 6.30, when we go through the book, book of Revelation, uh, and a lot of you say you liken it unto drinking out of a fire hydrant. <laughs> is this true? Yeah, well, I can't go slow. I apologize. There's a ton of stuff in Revelation, too much to go slow. But uh, we, over in the room outside here, we have uh, all of our college students are over here in a room. They have pizza, food, everything. It's the way to do Bible study. They're over here while the adults are in here starving. They're over here, you know, having food and enjoying themselves. And they've been with my Revelation class since we started. And then after they go to the class, they, they have discussion and debate and, and awesome. Those are gibor, giborim. Those are warriors of God who are, who are learning about God's plan for the planet how he's going to reclaim the planet, how he's going to deal with sin and evil, deal with the devil, etc., cetera, and, and righteousness is going to reign, and all those college students are here on Sunday nights. That's awesome. Again, there's hope for our country. Why? We've got a room full of college students in love with Christ. What does the promise of the Scripture say? If you have parents raising children like that, God's going to make that generation a blessed one. Number two, fruit number two. If you fear God and follow him, follow his word, uh, his home or your home will be full of wealth. Verse 3, wealth and riches are, not might be, are in his house, the person who fears God and obeys the word, and his righteousness endures forever. So uh, I'm going to bring up something I've never talked about before. Sometimes I pass over stuff thinking, now they don't need to know that, but you, but you need to know what this is to understand the import of this, the first clause. Wealth and riches are in his house. So they're connected by... The, by and, a coordinating conjunction, correct? Grammar is important, is it not? Because it's inspired of God. So wealth and riches are connected by an and, and and from a figure of speech, that's called hendiades. You've probably never heard of it. You ever heard of hendiades? Really, you don't care? (laughs) You do today. Uh, Hendiades, what does hendiades mean? Hendiades means you take two two concepts and you wed them with a coordinating conjunction where the first word amplifies the second word. Okay, so you got that? So far? Okay. So how does, what does that mean? Well, the word riches here is really translated from the Hebrew text, sufficient. Oh. So what's it mean? Well, take the and out. What's the hendiades means? It means if you f- fear God and follow his commands, you by definition will have sufficient riches in your house. You know, I don't know about you, but I, I look back at my life when I got married and I had, I had, I didn't have anything. I didn't have any money. 
an uncle uh, gave me $500, and Liz and I thought we were loaded. We didn't have any money. We had people donating us couches for our apartment. We thought that was awesome. Some of the couches, I think, from, were from the 1940s. You know, I mean, really? Uh, but God blessed us. And there were many years that we, that we didn't have very much, but we always had sufficient. We always had sufficient. And sometimes God's blessed beyond the sufficiency. And so I think what he's talking about is uh, sometimes God does give you wealth, riches, but it's always in a sufficient manner. It's the way that it is. Um, one year when I was in seminary, I had a Camaro. So my uncle that gave me the $500, he was a very wealthy farmer in California. When I uh, turned 19, he bought me a brand new Camaro off the showroom floor. Uh, and he, so he blessed me with my first car. Uh, but that car, as it aged, and I was in seminary in the early 80s, uh, one day I was driving down the, the road from school, and the seat became detached from the, the body of the car. Try driving a Camaro, low to the ground and cool, and your seat comes off. I mean, unbolted. Un I mean, the weld broke. I mean, I was like all over the freeway. I was, it was unbelievable. So I... Uh, I, I uh, told my wife what happened. We didn't have any money to fix it. I was in seminary. We made $9,000 a year and tuition was four. We had no money, but God always made sure we had just enough. What's the promise? If you follow God and fear him, he will make sure you have sufficient riches to go through life. So the, there it is. My, my seat broke. So my wife's in dentistry. She works for a man named Dr. Thiem. Uh, Dr. Thiem used to be a, a chemist with, I think, Chevron. But he left that. He's a total brainiac. He's about six foot five, not a Christian man, very nice man. Uh, but Liz worked for him. Uh, he became a, a dentist like in his 40s. Just a great guy. And he found out that my seat came off my car. So one day he came by the house and he got the keys to my car and he left with it with that seat like that. I'm like, you're going you're gonna to die. <laughs> Uh, and, he, and he took it to a, a man that he knew that did welding, and he welded it for me, and he brought it back to me, uh, and no charge. He wasn't even a Christian, but he blessed our lives. He blessed our lives. And so Liz and I always had sufficient wealth, as, as it were, to function in life. Why? We put God first. We feared his holy name, and he made sure we had that sufficient riches to navigate through life. I'm sure you have your own stories. Another way to look at it is, if you look at the last clause, and it says his righteousness will endure forever, um, that can interpret the first clause. So instead of it being like physical riches, like Abraham had riches, Solomon had riches, and it's not wrong to have riches, God can bless you that way. But I think more, uh, put a finer point on it, when he says that his righteousness will endure forever, he's telling you that your riches aren't necessarily monetary, that your riches are holiness, that he blesses your life with greater holiness all of the time. Why? Because you fear him and you keep his commandments. And he blesses you with holiness. And he says, your holiness will endure for how long? Forever. That forever will your family talk about you in the family line. Forever in heaven, as the angels approach you, they'll go, oh, I remember 65 in your life. Wow, what decisions you made for God. I remember 82, 2012. They will remember the stories. He says, bank on it. They will remember your holiness down the, the halls of time. Yeah, a lot of people want to be remembered for lots of things. Who wouldn't want to be remembered as being a person that put God first, obeyed his commandments, and God said, think of the holiness of that person. Number three, fruit number three. Again, you're asking yourself, what's hanging on my tree? my acrostic. His life is, spir is a spiritual light. That's what his life is. It says in verse 4, light arises in, the preposition is very important, light arises in the darkness for the upright. Uh, he is three things, gracious, he's compassionate, and he's also righteous. So the fact that light arises in the darkness tells you the Christian is at this point of the verse in darkness. What this means is there are times in a wisdom psalm when uh, your life goes south, when things aren't easy, when adversity comes your way, when you're in the storm of your life. Uh, he says that sometimes that happens to a believer. But notice he says when you're in the middle of darkness, whether it's a moral darkness, spiritual darkness, whatever it is that you're in that's dark, he says in the middle of that, you are the light in that. Why? Because you fear God and you keep his commandments that even in the most adverse situation, you are one who shines. And what shines about you in the darkness in which you live? Three words. What are they? You're gracious to people. 
and when people are not gracious, when they're mean-spirited. You're compassionate to folks when people don't show compassion to other people. Uh, and you are righteous, meaning you're holy. And people all, people all around you see it. So when you think about Jesus, um, when he was wronged by the godless people who were jealous of his teaching ability, when the throngs of people went to him and the Pharisees could absolutely not stand that and they went after Christ, uh, well, Christ would uh, not retaliate. He would turn the other cheek. Many times he'd be quiet. Uh, when uh, he encountered a person that was caught in sexual sin, a, a young lady, what did he do when they tried to stone her? He looked at her and said, I don't see any of your accusers here anymore. Go and sin no more. He was gracious to her. Uh, that's the way Jesus was. So you can look at the life of Jesus and say he, he was the essence of Psalm 112 because he was the light wherever he went, no matter how dark it was. So when he's on the sea with the disciples and, and, and a storm hits their boat and it's about to sink, he's asleep down below decks. He's at peace. There's shalom about him in the middle of a storm. And he just comes up on deck and says a couple words. What's he say? Peace be still. And the entire sea was calm. See, that's Jesus in action as a, as a blessed man, as a godly man. Uh, your life should be the same. That no matter what's happened in your life, no matter what the darkness is, you and that should say, but above all things, I'm a light to my family, uh, at the Pentagon where I'm at, maybe at the White House. Wherever I'm at, my life in the adversity is to be uh, shining brightly for Christ because that's a fruit of a blessed life. Number four, I like verse five. It says that uh, this person's fruit is he's not stingy. Do you like to share your stuff? Why are you so quiet? You, you don't even like to share that I'm talking about sharing. Do you share your things? Notice what it says about this person. This person is, uh, they're no Grinch. They're not tight-fisted. It says in verse 5, it is well with the man who is gracious and does what? Lends. Uh, he will maintain his cause in judgment. We'll talk about that cryptic saying just a second. Let's focus on the fruit of this person. Remember, it's an acrostic, how God has blessed my life. Well, he's blessed my life uh, as I've been a person known for lending. So this is the kind of Christian that uh, if you need something and they have it, what are they going to do? They're, they're going to loan it to you. Now, have you ever loaned any something and got, never got it back? You know, that, well, it happens. I've had that happen to myself. There's reasons why. But, but if you're a truly a godly person who fears God, keeps his commandments, if somebody's got an is issue, they have something that they need, and you have it, you're going to loan it to them. Well, they, they, need a, they need an extra couple of tables, and we've got, we've got the chairs, and, uh, you know, and I'm going to loan those to them you know, for a dinner that they're having. Or if they need a tool, uh, you know, I don't mind loaning them my tool as long as they don't you know, like trash my tool. I'll, I'll, I'll lend them my tool. Uh, suppose, they, suppose they hit a hard spot in their life and, and, and they need money. What will you do? Well, in some situations, you would loan them money. 45% interest? No, probably zero interest. Uh, and, and I've had situations in my life, as Liz and I have gone through life with not having much when we were younger, uh, when people stepped into our lives at different times and lend, l l gave us money, uh, to help us, and I've repaid them because that's the godly thing to do. But that's just believers helping believers, and that's what he says. This, the fruit's hanging on my my tree because I'm the kind of person who's gracious when I see needs and I lend. It says in here, uh, he will maintain his cause in judgment. So what does that mean? So that means this kind of person uh, isn't clueless when it comes to living. They kind of survey the situation. So case in point, if I have a neighbor across the street from me who has a flat tire. Uh, and uh, they might be having some financial issues and stuff like that. Um, uh, if, if, if it's a grown man with an issue and he has a viable job, et cetera, uh, I kind of survey, survey the situation and I kind of evaluate the situation to determine should I help them or not. So if it's a grown man changing a tire, well, I'm probably not going to go over there and say, hey, uh, you need some help. Because he's probably got that covered, correct? But if it's a 78-year-old woman on a walker with, a, with an oxygen tank, you see what I mean? I'm putting the cookies on the lower shelf. Uh, if it's that person and I see them across the street with a flat tire, I, I, I can use my judgment and make a proper judgment about, I got to go help them, right? That's what he's talking about. So you will lend yourself, your time, your abilities, etc. cetera. Uh, and that's just the kind of person that you are. You're not stingy. You're not stingy. Is that you? That's a godly person. Number five, I love this one, especially in the culture in which we live. It says, this person is stable. That's a fruit hanging on their tree. They're stable. Do you know people who are not stable? 
Boy, I do. Not predictable. They're up. They're down. You don't know. You're like walking on eggshells around them. You don't know what's going to trip them off. They're just not stable. That's like most of our country. What does this say? Verse 6. For he will, this kind of Christian, will never be shaken. The righteous will be remembered forever. He will not fear evil things. His heart is steadfast. Why? Well, he's trusting in the Lord. His heart is upheld. He will not fear. He's now told you that two times. Uh, until he looks with satisfaction on his adversaries. He is a stable person. Why? Because he fears God and obeys the commandments of God. So when he faces evil, he's not fearful. He's not fearful. So think about life events. Life events, be what they may, do not cause this kind of person uh, to shake in their boots, no matter what. I mean, who hasn't gone to the doctor and got the results back from a test and you didn't like what the doctor had to say to you? But you walk out of the office fearful? No. Why? Because you fear God and you keep his commandments. And you know God's sovereign. He's got this. You're not fearful because you're not shaken. Uh, when you think of uh, Esther and Mordecai, you can think about two, two saints in the past who, when they faced tragic events concerning their people, they did not fear. Why? Because they were godly people following hard after God. And even in the adversity, they knew God would take care of them. It says that evil news uh, doesn't, uh, doesn't cause this person to like freak out. They don't fear evil, evil tidings. You probably can't go throughout a week, maybe even a day, without reading evil, unsettling news. Just surf the net, and you'll find all kinds of stuff. It's like, I, I, can't, I can't sleep because of all that I just read. No, if you're a stable saint who knows God's in sovereignly in control, then no matter what you hear is going on as the culture unravels, You'll not fear. Why? Because God has promised you, if you walk closely with him, he will bless your life greatly. So no matter what you face, you will be okay. I think I have a picture of a, a German sign uh, in the, um, yes, this is hiking. I, and I know you, I mean, you might not be able to read that, but uh, it, it talks about that you need Alpine uh, Erfahrung, uh, experience. And then that next one, uh, Tritt Zickerheit, is uh, you have to have sure-footedness. Uh, and it goes on to say, and you need to be freedom from dizziness is required. I love that sign, don't you? Because I read that sign this week when I was surfing the net, and I'm like, because I just typed in the word sure-footedness, and this came up. And I'm like, oh, a German sign. What's, you know, what's it say? Well, it just told you what. If you're going to hike here, you better not get dizzy when you look down from 10,000 feet off a cliff. You better have really sure feet when you're hi hiking on shale and all this stuff. Uh, it, it's totally required. And I, I was reading it, and I was thinking, that's exactly like life, isn't it? It comes with one of those signs that if you're going to walk down this road, wherever it is, you shouldn't fear. Why? Because God says, if you follow hard after me and you fear me, I'm with you. Don't fear anything. Don't fear anything. I think a lot of Christians in our, in our world today are way too fearful and have forgotten that you're not the ones that should be fearful. Those who should fear are the ones who don't fear God. Number six, verse nine, he says, this person is a giver, not a getter. He's a giver. Verse nine, he is given freely to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. His horn will be exalted. He gives freely to the poor. This is different than the other one. The other one, is, other one is you're lending things to people just to get them out of a, a tight spot. They probably can pay you back, you know, that kind of thing. This is, they're destitute. They're absolutely abject poverty, poor, have a tough situation. There's no way they can get out of. And you step in and you help them and give them whatever it is they need. Could be money, could be a car, could be things. Uh, but you step in to bless them uh, and, and you do that because you're a godly person. Now, I, am not, I was toying with whether to give you illustrations of this, either from the church or from my life, but I can't do it because of the following verse in Matthew chapter 6, verse 2. Jesus said, when you give to the needy, don't announce it with trumpets. <laughs> dun, 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 dun. I'm about to give to somebody. As the hypocrites do in the synagogues on the streets, that's what the Pharisees did, uh, to be honored by others. Truly, Jesus says, I tell you, they have received their reward in full when they blow the trumpet to announce their giving, Right? He goes on to say, but when you give to the needy, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving may be done in secret. Then your father who sees what is done in secret, then he'll reward you. Don't go around telling people, yeah, I've got the fruit of giving on my tree. Did you hear me? 
Because I've actually had people say this. Don't walk around telling people, man, that fruit is laden. No, 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 no. That's between you and God. So I'm not going to give you an illustration of a Christian who gives and who's not a getter because our church is full of them. I've done it myself because that's a godly thing to do. But, but if you are writing your acrostic of how God has blessed you, may one piece of fruit hang in there be, I'm a giving person when I see needs. No greater thing. And then he says here, you're right, his, his righteousness will endure forever and his horn uh, will be exalted in honor. What this is talking about is the long-range effects of a life of giving, meaning when you give to somebody that's poor and indigent and has needs, what you did for them will be like a, a rock dropped in a pond, that you will impact their life, the life of their little children, maybe the life of their family, and out beyond that, as people see that need met, it will echo down the halls of time. God's promise is on that. And lastly, fruit number seven, hanging on the tree, is this kind of person knows he's a victor. He's not a victim. He's a, he knows he's a victor. Verse 10 says, the wicked will see it, his godly life, and be vexed. He'll be vexed. He says, he, the godless, will gnash at his, him with his teeth, and then he will melt away. The desire of the wicked will perish. This is an awesome verse. The wicked, what do they do? They see your godly life, your holy life, your righteous life, your life of giving, your life of compassion, your life of grace. It will drive them crazy it will drive them crazy it says it will vex them they will lay in bed at night thinking that person is driving me nuts with their holiness and then it says they will get so frustrated with you they will they will gnash at you with their teeth i mean just so mad just ah, gritting their teeth you're not going to grit your teeth you're going to grin why because you know that one day righteousness wins i'm going to tell you this again you don't grit your teeth. You grin and smile because you know that one day Jesus is coming and righteousness is going to reign. Matthew chapter 12, verse 35 says this. The good man out of his good treasure brings forth what is good. And the evil man out of his evil treasure brings forth what is evil. I say to you, Jesus says, that every careless word that a man shall speak, they shall render account for it on the day of judgment. For by your words, you'll be justified. And by your words, you're going to be condemned. Judgment day's coming. And when judgment day comes, you give account. And what's the righteous do who fears God and obeys his commandments? They're smiling the whole time they're standing before Jesus. Why? They're covered by his blood. They're forgiven. And God's going to tell them, I'm going to fulfill this last promise to you. I'm going to allow you to see victory in the evil that you've seen. Sometimes it seems like evil is just unchecked and wins all the time. Hang your hat on this verse because evil's not going to win the day. Righteousness wins the day. So you have an assignment this week. It's summer. You're laying low. You're not doing much, right? Assignment number two, create an acrostic where every letter of the alphabet represents a blessing, a fruit that God has put on your tree. And it's, it's for you to share with the Lord and bless them because of that. Let's pray. God, thank you. Uh, for the opportunity to look at a tree uh, of a godly person laden with spiritual fruit uh, because they, they put you first above all things and you bless them accordingly. Might our lives continually be populated with this kind of fruit, uh, not to our glory, but to yours. And thank you for the kind of people that are in our church that love you. In Christ's name, amen.